Sorry, this is the second hour of carving this ladle. Um, so now what I'm shooting for is this connection right here. I'm trying to push this down so that I get a nice curve here. And that's going to do two things. It's going to keep me from having to go all the way down to the bottom with this thinning it out. And it's going to, here, I'm going to move this around so you guys can see better what I'm doing. And it's going to make it have, ah, um, it's going to make it have a bit of an echo of the curve that I often put on my spoons here. So, um, but this is getting finicky as I get down here. So I want to build into it. And you'll notice how the tip of the knife can extend down into the hollow of the bowl without touching anything. So I'm using that to my advantage. But I want not to have it go too far. And then on that side, it doesn't. I just want to make it look even. Now, honestly, this is this is a little feature that I did not anticipate going in. It's going to happen. This little um, the way that this curvature right there allows me to go from the bowl into the other thing. It's my philosophy on the inner rim chamfer. Uh, can you go into a little more detail? What are you, what are you hoping to find out? Um, like, I think it's important for, I think that inner rim chamfer is important. Uh, on eating spoons, it's important for how it feels. And on all other spoons, it's important for the longevity of the piece. So now I've got a little bit, wasn't quite as careful as I should have been. So we're going to pull out the knife and do just a little bit, uh, what's its importance? So on eating spoons, it changes how it feels. Um, there we go. Uh, it makes it much more pleasant in the mouth. And on other spoons, it serves more of a, an important function of That's probably as nice as I'm going to get it. So I'm going to stop. Um, and on other spoons, it serves the important function of um, durability. So uh, now, as long as I have the hook knife out, actually, I'm going to do it. I always do my inner rim chamfers with the hook knife because they're designed to get up out of the way. Notice... There's still some chaff there. I'm going to go in with the Sloyd knife and get that out. Do you have any suggestions for someone wanting to get started? Basic tools, types of wood, etc. Um, oh, man. That's such a juicy question and difficult to answer right off the bat. I would say find some people whose work you admire and who seem to be sharing a lot of stuff and just absorb a lot of their stuff. Because you don't even know, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I think finding somebody who happens to have done a like how to get started on spoon carving video is not necessarily the most useful thing. Because there's so many ways to get started on spoon carving. I think it more matters that you find somebody who's work speaks to you and whose philosophy speaks to you and who seems to be sharing a lot um, so that you can learn from them. For me, that was Jojo Wood back in the day. She's not sharing as much anymore. Um, <laughs> thanks, man. Uh, you know, it was Jojo Wood. It was Robin Wood back when he was doing his blog. Um, you know, so finding those people and then just like, you know, most of people who are in that camp 
will have thousands of posts and among those posts will be some very educational ones. So he's saying, nice seeing a continuous experiment. Of course, we're all taught not to have short end grain, but how many of us have deliberately tried it? Right, exactly. So I want to um, see how far I can push this. I'm guessing I can push it quite far and be very happy with it. So, um, I also suspect that for something like a ladle, you know, a ladle doesn't get a ton of wear and tear. Um, you know, a ladle has this crank issue of like, that's a really steep bend. If your grain is running out this way in, in layers, then you need to leave it thick. Well, my thinking was if I left it wide, how would that change that? So now I've got the rim the way I want it. I've got the rim this way the way I want it. I've got the bowl the way I want it. I've got this transition the way I want it. Now it's time to neaten up the sides of the handle and run chamfers on the handle. And then I don't speak French, sorry man. Um, and then I'm gonna do the outside of the bowl. And that's pretty standard at this point for how I do all sorts of stuff, um, all, all other shapes as well. So at this point, I'm just gonna I'm liking the lines of this, so I think I'm just going to maintain the straight lined thing and just kind of let it have a slight taper towards the end here. Good, that looks good. Do the other side. Okay, that looks good. Yeah. Uh, I'm really using a lot of leverage on lately. Spec if the bowl is nice and thick, it should be fairly durable. Um, <laughs> interesting you said that. I'm planning on making the bowl quite delicate. Uh, not nearly as delicate as like my eating spoons. But basically what I found is with my eating spoons is that you can get them way more delicate than you think you can. And, you know, for something like a ladle that's not being used in the same way that a cooking spoon is, I suspect that as long as I have the center thicker than the sides, that I'll be able to um, make it much more delicate than we predict and have it last just fine. We shall see, though. Yeah. We shall see. Okay. Just trying to ease that transition without having to recut it. I don't want to have to recut that. Clean it up. I really like how this line swirls right up into the handle. That's super exciting to me. Um, okay. Oh, and then there's this section here. Notice how I'm not pulling the knife towards myself. The knife is braced, and I'm actually pulling the ladle handle away from myself. So when you see it pop, it's not that the knife is coming in towards me to stab myself. It's a uh, that the ladle's popping away from myself. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited about this. I really think it's going to work out. Okay, so now this side. I mean, I've never been one to follow the like gotta gotta have the form follow the grain, anyways. So. Um, and I think it's more about understanding exactly how much material you need to leave to be strong enough and exactly where you need to leave it and have the skill to be able to do exactly that and no more. And I think it's once you got that, that rule of following the grain doesn't, it's not that it doesn't apply to you, it's that it doesn't, it doesn't hold as much water because it's, you know, I think it, that has more to do with like how to make it so that there's some uh, slack in the system in case you mess up. But if you're less likely to mess up and you don't need as much slack in the system, 
extra superfluous strength in the system because you're going to leave the strength exactly how much you need and where. Well, then a lot of things open up. So, okay. So now we've straightened up those sides. We've got a very slight taper. Leakage through the end grain. Hey, thanks, man. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, I think it will help that it's not going to be like a cup. You're not asking a ladle to like sit there and hold a liquid for forever. You're asking it to transfer the liquid, which is a really different thing, you know? Um, so, I mean, and cherry is not exactly a porous wood. So I really think it's gonna be just fine. All right, so the other thing I need to do before I do anything else is address the back of this as well. So. And this is also my chance to make this even more delicate, should I want to, which I which I do. I do want to. So, yeah. Oh, it's getting to be so nice and delicate. Oh, I love it. And I also think that making the handle on the delicate side will encourage people to use the spoon more delicately. Right? If you leave the handle super stout, that sends the wrong signal to people of like, oh yeah, this is something that I can just wail around with. That being said, I really think this is, it still feels so strong because it's so wide. There's absolutely no flex to this, even though it's super thin. Um, how cured is the wood I'm carving? Basically fresh. This was fresh enough to show, you know, moisture loss as I was axing it out. I mean, it's been mellowing in the log for months, but it had, it was not like some of the wood that's been mellowing that where it has like rotten outer stuff. And um, like this was a freshish looking piece. Um, but cherry dries out real quick as you're carving it. One of the things I love about it dearly. All right, so we're gonna chase that outer line to look the way I want it to look on both sides. And again, I want to let it flare a little bit at the tip here. Keep the tip on the stronger side. Very good. Yeah. There we go. All right. This is what I love about chasing weird forms like this. Um, wait, 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 what I'm going for with the design. Uh, yeah, no, you could, you could. And that's an interesting point, right? Like I sort of feel like um, in some designs, it's worth seeing how narrow you can go, but then there are plenty of designs where just because you can go narrow doesn't mean that the design benefits from it. And that's been an interesting thing for me to recognize and think about, right? So like, if you think about how my cooking spoon design, it was like, it used to be narrow, particularly at the neck, and then I realized that that wasn't comfortable. And then I went thick, and to my mind, I went a little too thick, and now I pulled it back, because I'm trying. what I'm trying to find is that perfect point at which it feels just right in your hand, but looks relatively narrow. So to me, it's always about finding the right functionality and then figuring out how you can tweak the form to get it to look really sweet while having the correct functionality. Oh my gosh, guys. Getting this that last little bit thinner has made a huge difference in how delightful it feels. It feels so good right now because it's so thin. What I want is for the thinness of this to mirror the thinness of the bowl as it's finally going to be. Um, and then have it be just a slight swell up here so it feels nice and controlled in your hand. Okay. Let me blend these two together. Make sure that the line on the outside is exactly the way you want it. And then when you blend the middle, it doesn't really matter if you get it perfectly flat across or not. 
make sure that line is the way you want it. Whenever you need to have like real control using the thumb push like this will give you tremendous control and keep you from slipping further than you intend. So in this area where I want to blend cuts from one direction into cuts coming from the other direction, I'm going to use thumb push. There we go. Look at how thin that is. And look at how flat it appears, right? It appears to be very flat without me fussing too much over it and it has a nice taper just like that. Okay, so now where was I? I was taking this facet and running it down the back of the handle. Okay, and I don't want to make it a super strong facet. I just want it to be enough to kind of knock off the corner. And then I'm going to knock off the corner of each of each side of this facet itself to soften the whole thing. Because what I want is for I don't want the facets to define the form. I want the planes of the surface to define the form and to have them be connected by essentially curving facets. That's the thing I'm interested in right now. Okay, let me do this side of things. And you can see why having it, the handle tapered just slightly is really helpful. Because if I had had the handle be perfectly straight, it would be a lot more difficult to do these facets at this point. At this point, we're good. So it's going to behave. It is good. Yeah, just like that. And Thanks, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked with how this is turning out. So now, and those are being kind of rough with these micro chamfers, right? They don't need to be perfectly precise. It's more that they need to have a nice line that they create for your eye to see. It feels like the more important thing. Like that. Okay, good. Now we're going to do facets on this side of things. Very good. Okay. More difficult because of the possible diving into the grain, tapering of the handle. Um,. If I didn't taper the handle, then it would be less obvious which direction it would want to be cut in. And that goes both for the main cuts and for the facet cuts and for the micro chamfer cuts. So all the cuts would be affected in terms of understanding how they should go in the grains so that you don't have tear out. Because there's nothing worse than trying to do a micro chamfer and having grain tear out because the, you know, the tolerances are so small that then you sort of you're like, oh, how am I going to get this to not show? And it turns into one of those things where you either have to accept it and walk away, never my strong suit, or, um, you know, or, or chase it down and try and make it go away, which usually results in sort of endless back and forth thing. Um, so by having it have a taper, I, I, avoid that whole situation really um, okay good All right good good
Okay. Yeah, that that's um that seems like it's gonna be really nice. Um that was that was that was not part of the original design, right? So that's like looking at the piece of wood and letting your design respond to what the piece of wood is telling you. And what happened was I was using a piece of wood and it just naturally had a tail flip like that. And I thought, well, that makes perfect sense. If I, if I keep that tail flip, it seems like what you would want to do when you hold on to this thing, because the, the handle comes up so steeply from the bowl, is you'd want there to be some sort of little thing that helped you not, helped it not just slip right out of your hand. Now that I've done it and I really like it, you know, if I do another one of these, if somebody actually orders one, um, you know, I'll probably probably keep it as part of the design. But it was not how I was, you know, I was originally envisioning something super simple. And just as it is with most of my designs, a lot of times the little details that make the design very sweet are not something that I've come up with ahead of time. There's something that happens organically from the process of carving it. And it's about paying attention to the opportunities presented you. Similarly with this little rounded detail down here. Um, hey Matt, um, I've been live for a long time. Um, yeah, Matt, this is, I'm like two and a half hours in here. This is ridiculous. All right, but I'm really digging this form that I'm making here. And I think I, I think, well, we'll see how the, the outside of the bowl turns out, but I'm super stoked with how, how the whole thing has turned out so far. It just feels so good. Oh man. Okay. So now, so now I've got chamfers all over the handles, the whole nine yards. So now I need to make the outside of the bowl the way I want it to be. And I've got a ton of material on the bottom here. Um, so probably going to start by just thinning out some of that material in the bottom before I go too crazy on the sides. Just like that. I have to say, so just from the, a business standpoint, ha preserving a certain amount of time, for me it's the weekends, you know, I'll carve one, maybe two things a weekend. Preserving that time to carve forms for exploration is really important. Because otherwise I feel like the my ability to try new things would really be hampered. Um, and so much of the growth in my business has come from being able to try carving new things, have somebody, not always, sometimes there are duds, say, oh yeah, make me one too, please. Um, that's where, you know, sort of growth and increased sales comes in my business is creating things during the time that I've kept to be exploratory time and then having that turn into something else that I do. Um, and so for a long time, I've had the weekend, I call it, you know, the weekend special where even if I had a waiting list of months, you know, I put, I put whatever I carve on the weekend up for sale and then it's fair game to anyone and it sort of exists outside the waiting list and it gives people a chance to snag something without waiting. And it also gives me a chance to try stuff that otherwise wouldn't get a chance to try because people are ordering existing forms. So for anyone who's, uh, you know, worried about doing a carve to order thing because you worry that you would squash your 
creative freedom, this was a, it turned out to be a great solution for me. Um, now right here, I feel like I need to be careful to not put too much torque on the wood right here. Like I don't want to essentially pry with my thumb here. I want to hold it here in a stable way and carve like this in a way that's not prying at the wood. Because as I get more delicate, that's going to become problematic. Um, and I'm just going around and trying to maintain, you can see more has come off that side than off that side. So I'm trying to keep everything even as I go around so the whole thing doesn't get lopsided. And certain sides, this side, carves more slowly than the other side because I can't hold on to the handle in the same way. Um, but preserving this time on the weekends to carve stuff is, uh, you're spatchcocking a chicken. Nice. Um, yeah, although Chuck, I'll probably try smoothing them out as much as I can. Uh, you know, I've tried doing sort of lots of facets and bold facets the way Jojo does. And honestly, I, I return to sort of trying to make it as smooth as possible, largely because it helps improve my technique. Um, you know, it, if I stick with doing large facets, well then I don't develop the skill to not have large facets, if that makes sense. Um, so we'll see. What I find is that if you do facets at first and you keep knocking off corners, keep knocking off corners, not in any sort of deliberate sense, but just by doing it, that gradually your strokes get smoother and smoother and the whole form starts to look more and more rounded, essentially. Um, and that that's really nice. Okay. Right. Oh, starting to get so nice. All right. Um, the other thing is that for whatever reason, probably because having to do with trying to remove material quickly, the early facets usually have better to them. And as you go along, you get sort of smoother and smoother facets because you're you're not pushing as hard to remove stuff. Um, one thing I want to do is just one little swipe on the inside here. There's a bit of a bump right here. I want to just be a little bit picky. Yes, ooh, that makes a big difference. It's always a pet peeve of mine is when there's a little bump in the front of the spoon bowl. That's just, you know, one or two cuts would have done it. Oh yeah, it, I mean, it would, yeah. I mean, inevitably, you, with something like a ladle bowl, you do end up with uh, something that feels more um, facety just because it's it's impossible not to. Um, but I have been able to really tone down that faceted look and it's been really helpful for my carving to deliberately try to tone it down as much as possible. It just means that I have more options if I know. You see how I'm making these cuts and the cuts are starting to smooth out and get longer as I'm sort of leaping from one facet to the other. It's no longer about going, you know, going chop, chop, chop. I'm actually covering two or three facets at a go. That's how you smooth them out. Now, see how there's a bit of a lump here, here, and to a lesser extent here. I need to address that before I make this too thin back here. Um, so, this stage, thinning out the bottom of the bowl, is the, the one that's easiest to not go far enough with and end up with a spoon that doesn't feel quite as amazing as it could. 
because when you can get the bottom of the bowl, when you have the patience to get the bottom of the bowl just the right thickness, oh my gosh, it's it's unreal how good it feels. Um, but it takes it takes patience. You've got to put in that extra 15, 30 minutes to get it down to the right size and have the skill to do it delicately at this stage without damaging any other part of the spoon. Right? Like essentially I'm cutting, this is all end grain here, so I have to be delicate as I go about it. I think it's going to be really nice. I'm already loving how this feels so much. Oh, oh it's so, like you can grip it. It feels super strong. I feel like this is gonna have design ramifications for a bunch of my spoons. I'm gonna put this up on YouTube. You think I missed a bit? Yeah, you, you yeah, man, you missed like uh, two hours already. Um, yeah. Thanks, Debbie. Um, I'm loving this ladle too. Um, You know, it's small as ladles go, but man, sometimes there's a there's a space for that kind of sauce ladle um, in people's kitchens, and I just oh, it feels so good. I haven't even burnished it yet, and I can't take my hands off it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, so far so good, Chuck. I think I do. I I cleared everything out between the first and the second that I could, so in theory I have enough room. Um, certainly the first two saved, and I'll be putting those up on YouTube. And I have hope that this one will save as well. Now you can see I've managed to push back that bump there, but I, now I need to address the top bit. I'm just going to get this here. So when I feel it, what I'm feeling is that there is quite a significant taper where it's thin and then it gets thick, you know, when I'm here-ish. Um, so I want there to be a certain amount of taper, but not that much. So, um, the first step is going to be pushing down this middle so that I can then create the kind of taper I want. But remember how I said, like when I, when we were carving the middle of the bowl that you don't want to start at the edge and work your way in and have this like big lump that you still have to work your way down in. Um, how long have I been carving? Uh, five years since I was a beginner and probably, how many years has it been? I guess we're going on three years since I quit my summer job and bought a phone and got on Instagram. Um, um, but yeah, five years total um, since I really started pursuing this. And then probably the last two years I've been really, you know, trying to carve every single day and the last year and a half really this has been a sort of big part of what I've done. How about you, Northwoods Hill Farmers? Are you a spoon carver? I imagine you are, otherwise you wouldn't have watched so much of this. Being super delicate around this rim. Trying not to put more pressure than I need to.
just had an idea. I'm gonna have this transition here be a curve that matches the curve in here. I love it when I do that kind of thing. Um, wait, hold on, let's see, it's an end grain ladle. It is an end grain ladle. Uh, all right, Chuck, lovely to see you. Have fun carving. Okay, so this is a super subtle detail that I'm putting in here. But essentially, there has to be some sort of transition from the flatness to the roundness. And I decided to try and create a curve that is the mirror opposite of that curve there. It'll be subtle, but, um, but we'll see. You're a garlic farmer, former special ed teacher. Nice. Yeah, I, I, uh, I do garlic too. Hey, thanks, Sam. How are things with you? How's the um how's the chair apprenticeship going, Sam? Oh, and by the way, I've been loving the IGTV videos you've been doing recently. Something about your lighting and the way you set it up. It's just really clean and easy to watch, man. Well done. It's inspiring for me. Step up my game. That looks really sweet. Okay, so now you can see I've got a nice curve that matches this here. That curve there is matched by that curve there. Ooh, I love stuff like that. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna go back to thinning out the, the bit up top here. So I brought my rim to quite delicate and now it's just a matter of getting the thickness right and I want to attack where it is thickest and bring that down to about what I hope it to be which is still thicker I want it to be thicker at the bottom of the ladle than at the top of the ladle um, but I want it to be the right thickness more than anything else. I want to have just enough thickness to be strong, but not so thick that it feels clunky. The way I usually describe it, um, progressing well, moving to new workshop this time next year. Oh, you moved into the new workshop this time next year. Yeah, uh, that's really exciting. Do you do you have like a length of time that you're going to be working, learning that craft, or is it more up in the air? Um, so the way I usually describe it is that there's a point at which when you're thinning out that the spoon starts to come alive, and you can feel it when it gets to that point. Um, there here so close so close um, but first I need to address this top up bit here because um, again I want to approach that feeling of it coming alive from all dimensions I don't want to have to go do any heavy lifting carving when the spoon is more delicate than how it is right now excuse me Okay, so, wow. And you can see how, even though I'm just continuing here um, to do the same cuts, as I get more and more of a rounded shape, the length of my cuts lengthens out 
And you'll also notice that these cuts are, some are push cuts, but some like that are sort of pivot cuts where I'm pivoting the knife around my thumb like that. And that allows me to get a longer, smoother cut. And as I do more of those longer, smoother cuts, the whole thing gets smoother and smoother and it gets easier and easier to get smoother and smoother. So it's a, it's a ratchet, sort of ratcheting in the direction of things getting smoother and less bumpy. Um, which is why I shoot for as perfectly smooth as I can make it and the end result will be nicely faceted. But if I shot for nicely faceted, the end result would be sort of much more roughly faceted than what I get from trying to make it perfectly smooth. So that for me is an important distinction. All right, so I do want to be aware that I don't want to go too thin here. Getting relatively close to how I think I want to make it. So again, I'm seeking out the high points and tackling those. Not just the high points between two facets, but the high points in terms of the arc of the form. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, you're more training than a full-time job. That's awesome. That's so cool, Sam. Um, and it seems like it's suiting your personality well to be doing it. Um, so, oh, this is really cool. As it starts to smooth out and you start to feel it, you start to get that, ooh, that exciting feeling. Still like a little bump here, a little bump here, but I can feel the gorgeousness that it's going to be. I'm, I'm a big believer that forms like this have kind of a um, an inevitability about them. And you know what? I don't like how this appears a visual bump on the side. So that whole thing that I worked hard to create, I'm gonna make it go away. Because for me, it's it's, Having something clever like that going on is not as important as having the overall thing sort of feel, have that like inevitable feeling to it of, oh my gosh, I can't believe how perfectly formed this thing is. Yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. when I remove this bump here and the whole thing just flows over the top. But before I do that bump there, I want to work a little more from this side because this side is less stable and supported and therefore I want to do it first. Um, it's funny to me and probably this is because this has been going on for close to three hours now. It's funny to me how there are fewer people watching now than there were in the beginning. And to me, I think this is where like all the real lessons are. Like, I feel like it's actually pretty easy to get to this stage, but from this stage or like this sort of level of detail work that I'm doing now, I feel like this is where the secret sauce is at. Like this is where, this is what separates something that's amazing from something that's cool, but not amazing. And it's the, it's this kind of detail of like paying attention to what's the curvature, what's the thickness. Um, what's my time? Time is quarter to four. 
Yeah. So it's also getting dark here and I have to go walk the dogs, but I'm very close. I'm gonna I think I'm gonna make it. So What should the orientation be in the log for a ladle? Well, this orientation is different than what I would normally recommend. Um, this orientation in the log for the ladle was top of the log, ladle cut down in, and then the handle is on the bottom of the piece of wood. Um, you think it's because of the time difference? Yeah, it might be. If I'm watching. Yeah, yeah. I think it just has to do with it's like there's less change obviously happening, right? It looks sort of like small, uninteresting things are happening. And yet to my mind, this is like exactly where the magic happens. Um, it's when you feel that bump that is keeping it from being just the most perfect sweet curve and then you make that bump go away. And then you do that over and over. And notice how much I'm sort of hopping around from place to place. If I got bogged down trying to work my way perfectly from one side over to the other side, guaranteed I'd push further than I had to and end up having to do a lot more cutting. So it's, um, it's about sort of hopping around, feeling the overall shape and hitting the high spots and then going and hitting the high spots somewhere else and then hitting the high spots somewhere else. And it's not about trying to like chase one perfect curve all the way around. You stabbed your saw today. <laughs> yeah, that'll that'll do it. That's one way to do it. With that thumb push, you're squeezing your palm. That thumb push. Are right, I squeezing with my palm closed while pivoting? Yes, that's so important. It's it's actually moving the wood back against it, and I'm not really pushing with my thumb at all. It's all about moving my fingers. And then steering with this hand, but there's no power coming from this hand. And then if there's a pivot at the end to extend it, then that's that's a bonus. But really it's about the power is coming from this hand. Which is why I sort of think that we're all of us, even if we don't think we're carving ambidextrously, we actually are carving ambidextrously. Because um, that thumb, that sorry, that uh, I call it a hand squeeze cut, is using your off hand. You're using power from your off hand to achieve that. So... So close. All right, so what I'm searching for is for it to be the right thickness of the rim and then tapering to be slightly thicker in the middle. And that's going to keep that delicate rim nice and strong. And it's going to help tremendously with the fact that this is end grain. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm just going to go and pull that rim thickness a little bit more, just a smidgen more.
Ooh, it's so hard to do there at the tip. So uh, a couple years ago, I, maybe it was last year, I can't remember. No, it must have been, it was like maybe it was this time last year. At any rate, I sent um, Tom Bartlett, Silva Spoon, ordered a kitchen set of stuff for me. And so, you know, it's for him, so I did the very best I could. And, uh, but, uh, and he liked everything, but he said, you know, the coffee scoop is a little clunky. And I thought, you know what, he's totally right. And it was because I knew what needed to happen to make it just a little further. Um, uh, but I was just not, I didn't do it. I didn't spend the time to get it that perfect amount of thickness and taper. And ever since then, it kind of set me on a real tear to make sure that whenever I send off a piece into the world, whether it's to somebody like Tom Bartlett, who's a very discerning person, or someone who I have no idea how discerning they are, I am putting in the time to make sure that the piece is beautifully delicate as I can make it, you know, and as sort of strength considerations warrant. And I never want to be, I never want to feel like, um, like I didn't go as far as I could have with a spoon. Because walking away because you're just going to make things worse is one thing. But walking away because you ran out of patience, to my mind, is not acceptable. So I can't even tell you what, the, what a huge difference this bowl is now from what it was 10 minutes ago. Now it feels practically, you know, perfectly round. And, um, and it didn't 10 minutes ago. So that's the thing is, you know, spending the time. And what I found is that all of my forms can be more delicate than I had been making them. That I can spend that extra bit of time on the outside of the bowl when I'm done with them, getting them to that perfect place where they feel like they've come alive. Oh, that's so nice. There's a little bit more to do right here. Yeah. We still send out those ones that you have to walk away from despite their flaws. Um, so ideally, if I walk away, then I've walked away at a point where they are still perfectly good spoons. They're just not, you know... I, ha I, I guess the answer is there is a threshold beyond which I will destroy a spoon rather than hold on to it or anything like that. And if I hit that threshold at any stage of carving, then I destroy it. That's extremely rare. And usually if it's going to happen, it happens in the first five or ten minutes of axing where I come across a crack and that's that. Um, Say it hasn't happened in actually carving a spoon for a long time at this point. Um, so that's, you know, so I try and make each one as good as I possibly can, I guess. And then outside of that, like as good as I possibly can, there's also sort of an external doesn't meet my gut sense of quality control. Um, and I generally know when it's not meeting that as I'm carving it, and I'll just stop. I'll just stop carving it. You know, if I'm like, you know what, this handle is never going to be thick enough to meet my standards of how thick this handle ought to be. It's like dangerously thin. I'm done. I'm, I don't even continue. Okay. Oh, this is feeling so good. So, now I 
just need to blend this bit back here. Um, hi Francis, do you know Mora Knife Classic number two? If so, can it be used as a carving knife? Uh, if that's the one with the red handle, that's the one I very first bought, and I would recommend that you don't buy that one. Buy the Mora 106. It's got a blade that looks like this, and it's going to do a much better job for you. Um, okay, so now I'm going to carve the rim chamfer on the outside of the rim here. I have to be super delicate because I don't quite know how it wants to be carved. And this is basically the last step. I really hate to screw it up now. I think. This is working okay. That detail is nice and clean. Do I struggle? Do I struggle with perfectionism? My remarked on patience. Um, no, I am the opposite. I am not a perfectionist, and if anything, I have to push myself to be more of a perfectionist. Um, I think a lot of spoon carvers are perfectionists because. Um, because it's a reductive art form and so it rewards perfectionists by essentially, um, you know, they tend to have better results because they're being careful, but that is not my tendency at all. And I'd say my strength is where I can sort of stop my, I can be, I can hold it together to be a perfectionist sort of for long enough to pull a spoon together. But you'll notice I don't do larger woodworking projects because I'm not a perfectionist. And um, and you'll also notice that my spoons are not always perfect. And I'm not really bogged down by perfectionism. You'll also notice that I like choose designs that are very kind of uh, forgiving. You know, in fact, a lot of what I do is based on sort of what's the most forgiving design that will allow me to not have to be perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, Debbie, I'm going to let you have it. Uh, I was going to ask $40 for it. Is that okay? Took three hours of my time here. Um, I think I can do them for less time in the future, but that's what I was going to charge. And uh, 